a warm welcome to the Thursday edition of the Our City COVID-19 show. I am Michaela Miller. The Western Cape accounts for nearly two-thirds of the COVID-19 infections nationally. President Cyril Ramaphosa will be visiting the province on Friday to inspect the facilities and attend a presentation by Premier Alan Windy on the province's strategic response. On the show today, we look at the second phase of the Provincial Health Department's strategic plan, schools in the province and the latest from the World Health Organization. And now for your headlines. The Western Cape government tightened its testing protocols due to the backlog of 27,000 tests. As schools reopen for grades 7s and 12s in the province, we asked meticulans how they felt about going back to school. Chris Barkley, co-founder and CEO of Health Warriors, tells us what they're doing to help South Africans deal with the anxiety brought about by the coronavirus. And the World Health Organization answers pressing questions on the vaccine Russia has alleged would cure the virus. It is day 70 of the lockdown and the current number of confirmed COVID-19 cases nationally stands at 37,525 with 19,682 recoveries and 792 deaths. The Western Cape has 24,657 confirmed cases, 13,696 recoveries and 601 deaths. The Western Cape government has decided to tighten its testing regulations for those living in the Cape Town metropolitan areas. As a result, people younger than 55 will not be tested for COVID-19, even if they develop symptoms. A backlog of 27,000 COVID-19 tests and a shortage of kits in the public sector lies behind the decision. You've got a big backlog here in the province. Our numbers are higher, so our backlog is higher. Uh, we've got 27,000 uh, tests uh, behind on backlog. Uh, we had a discussion, we luckily had the minister here, uh, Minister Mkise, here for two days this week. And one of the first things we spoke about was testing backlogs. There's a whole lot of uh, orders out to bring more into the country. Um, and so what we're doing now is we're just adjusting our strategy with the limited testing that we've got. So we're not just testing anybody and everybody. We are making sure that we're testing in our hospitals, our customers in our hospitals, the, the people coming for health care, and of course our health carers, they also need to be tested. We need to make sure that, uh, that uh, they are protected. So that's the one side of the strategy. The other is outside our, our, uh, the public. Uh, we are testing over the age of 55 and people with comorbidities. In other words, we're looking at our risk areas. We'd move into an area where there would be, say, a number of old people living in a, in a home or in a caring facility. We need to protect we need to make sure we look after the people that are at risk with the tests that we've got at the moment. So we're asking other people to also understand if you're strong and fit and young, please understand we're going to ask you to stand back and we're going to give the test to someone else who's at risk. The Western Cape Department of Health has opened a COVID-19 testing and triage facility at the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital. This is part of the second phase of a strategy to increase COVID-19 testing in the province and alleviate pressure on the health system. In the first phase, we saw the Western Cape Department of Health setting up 18 triage units in main hospitals. Now we're moving to the second phase of the Department of Health strategy to combat COVID-19. They are setting up other triage units in smaller hospitals, one of them being the Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital. These temporary units have been put up. Our first uh, tranche was uh, 18 of them that we put up at our big hospitals and uh, some of our uh, major clinics around the province. That was 18 and now we're in phase two. And so now it also creates extra space. So if you're trying to social distance in the reception area or trying to social distance uh, inside the hospital for going for a test or coming for a medical uh, uh, you know, call, uh, what happens is we now start to converge COVID-19 patients and pa other patients. So now this is a separate unit. 
uh, where if you think you're COVID or if we, if we know we're going to test you for COVID, we'll do it here in this facility and almost let's call it a red line. So you'll have a separate entrance, a separate line within the hospital system. We're rolling another 40 or this is another 13 uh, of these in the city itself and then another 20 of them out in our rural areas of the province. In winter, the hospital receives an influx of children suffering from respiratory diseases. This triage unit will help the hospital in testing and screening those who might have COVID-19 symptoms. This really, this facility is just to create extra space for patients that would normally come here. So no, it isn't a general uh, space for anyone to come. It's for children who are sick enough that normally come to Red Star Hospital for treatment. And the facility here is just merely a way of separating them out so that we try to not, uh, to, we try to minimize the mixing of children with potential COVID with other children with uh, chronic conditions. So it's part of our normal service that we run and it's just a kind of uh, uh, triaging and separating method um, to, so that we can protect the, the children that are sick with other comorbidities because we have a duty to them as well to try and prevent them from getting COVID on top of the other conditions. Since the lockdown, 37 patients have been tested positive in this hospital and seven are currently hospitalized. I am Octavian Lovu, reporting for our City News, Cape Town. Tuna Lady Coach Services bus drivers have been arrested for allegedly transporting passengers with fake permits. The bus was introduced to Cape Town from Tata in the Western Cape. Police spokesperson Brigadir Vishnaidu said the bus was stopped at the roadblock in Urbadeen where public ord police members asked to see permits. Naidu said it was then discovered that the driver and the co-driver were implicated in the purchase of fraudulent permits at the bus terminal at Mtata. Cape Town TV tried to get a hold of the bus company spokesperson Tabang Mateka who was unavailable to comment. Schools were to return to action on Monday, but due to schools in some provinces not being prepared to receive grade 7s and grade 12s, the reopening was moved to the 8th of June. Western Cape Education MEC Debbie Schaefer said the WCED has pulled out all the stops to ensure they were ready for the arrival of learners on the 1st of June. We asked some matric learners who had returned to school on Monday how they felt about their return and what they were hoping for. So I don't necessarily like feel safe about what is happening because there's nothing I'm hundred percent sure about your safety. Even though we um, um, doing what we have to do, going ahead with the whole precautions and stuff, sanitizing and all of that, nothing's hundred percent. But what I, what I can say about like attending school, it's it's good because now I'm I'm having a chance to interact with my teachers, having an understanding of my schoolwork which is kind of good, but at the end of the day, I think about how unfair it is to other school kids. My first day at school was Tuesday, the 2nd of June, and when I came to school, I was very excited to see my friends again, but I was also extremely nervous to be around a lot of people, but I trusted that the school would take the necessary precautions in order to keep us safe, and yeah. So basically, our school has done a lot of social distancing on the grounds and things like that, and they, they are very strict rules. There's signage up everywhere, hand sanitizers, hand sanitizing stations as well. And for my year ahead, as you just said, I am quite nervous because we have to write on our entire syllabus at the end of the year for national certificate. But I am hopeful. I know. Yesterday was my first day back at school and I must say it was rather strange and hectic. I say hectic because adhering to all the rules and having to follow safety precautions was overwhelming for me. Because now that we are finally able to see our friends, we aren't able to socialize as we used to and having to stand 1.5 meters away from each other and having to have a normal conversation was strange and frustrating. I'd rather be safe and stay at home and not come to school because <laughs> because you never know how the, the spread might come about, what's the next move and whatsoever. So it's better to be safe and stay at home. Staying with education, a teacher at a high school in the noon who asked to remain anonymous has alleged that the school had three cases of COVID-19 and called for assistance in the disinfecting schools and proper testing for remaining teachers.
the state now is that we are still, yesterday we promised that the, the company that is going to come and intimidate the school and clean the school. So we are still waiting and there is no briefing, there is nothing, no one is telling us what's going on. So we are just sitting outside, some of us in our cars, so waiting. We don't know what we're waiting for, but we're basically waiting for the company that is going to come and clean the school. We have three teachers now. Yes, we have a virus. At the moment. And the others are still waiting for the results. Those were in contact with those three teachers. We would love, like, we would love to be given like a day to go and test. And we, we, we need the school to be clean, clean to take, so that when we receive students again, we receive them in a healthy environment. So what is what is happening is that even the toilets are very dirty. The school has never been uh, cleaned, like thoroughly cleaned the way we are supposed to be cleaned. And we received students on Monday. So the fear that we have is that we don't even know our status and the school has not been cleaned since these three cases. So we're scared to spread the virus with the kids. What we received was um, a sanitizer and the mask and the scanner for the temperature just, just, just to scan the kids. We've been having meetings with the principal and the and the SMT members, and then we've been asking him to bring one of the department people so that we could ask the questions that he can't answer us. But it's been days and days since last Friday. We had a meeting Monday, same meeting Tuesday, even yesterday, same meeting. But there's no one who's willing to come to us. They only send messages or emails. They don't come and answer us. As yesterday, um, you see the problem is yesterday, we tried not to teach the kids. We were like, the principal, you need to let these kids go home. And we asked the question, does the SGP of the school and the parents of the kids are aware of these cases in our school? He couldn't answer us that one question. Because our fear was that if there is no parent could send a child to an environment that is not healthy for, 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 his, for his or her kids. So apparently the, the, the SGB and, and the parents, they seem like they don't even know what is going on in our school. And the school is yet not too clean. So we don't know what we're going to do after today if the school is not cleaned yet. Because what we want to do now, we want to go and test. And we don't know who's going to welcome these kids if all of us decide to take a leave and test. Kerry Martin, spokesperson for Education MEC, Debbie Schaefer said the district office had confirmed that teachers were at school today and that a company had been appointed to carry out a deep cleaning. Confirmed that the teachers are at school today and that a company has been appointed to clean the areas that they are concerned about today. We continue to give you the latest news about the city, province and abroad. When we come back, we'll be looking at mental health and the latest from the World Health Organization. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Channel 263 on DSTV and the Thursday edition of the Our City COVID-19 show on Cape Town TV. The Berg River Municipality has denied spreading rumours that one of its employees were the first COVID-19 case in the area. The Cape Times reported that Simonia Philander, the indigent examiner for the municipality, was sent for a test by employers despite not showing any symptoms. Philander said a week after she went for a test on the 5th of May, news was spread in Feldriff that she had the virus. Her name was mentioned on Facebook. Her rubbish not collected and she was shamed in shops. Rural and Farm Workers Development Organization Executive Director Billy Clarsen alleged the municipal manager spread the news in an email which the municipality has denied. Mental health is a growing concern that has been highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Various organizations have come forward to render services ranging from breathing exercises to yoga in an effort to ease the anxiety of many South Africans that are suffering. We spoke to Chris Barkley, co-founder and CEO of Health Warriors, to find out more about the organization and what they had to do. 
So HealthWorks provides well-being services uh, to companies, individuals, and communities. All of our work is led by young, talented South Africans that have grown up in tough circumstances. So we started about a year ago now, uh, working with a number of facilitators from communities and well-being professionals. So identify talented young people. There are many talented young people in South Africa looking for opportunities. So we try to find those talented, motivated young people and help them find employment and well-being services. Yeah, right now we're just focused in Cape Town, um, but actually in results of COVID-19, we're putting all of our services online. So within a few weeks, we'll be able to take classes from Vermont from anywhere in the world. Well, this was really hard during the first two levels of lockdown, uh, people feeling really isolated, not being able to move. And one of the big challenges we have is that uh, even though there are a lot of resources online, if you don't have access to a quiet space or you can't afford data, things like uh, taking a, an online yoga class isn't accessible or talking to a psychiatrist or psychologist. So over the last couple of months, we've been doing things over WhatsApp. So using low data communication channels to stay connected as a community, offering advice, doing group things together over WhatsApp. Um, and now we're trying to figure out under level three, how do we do social distance well-being services in communities uh, while we're also launching an online uh, wellness platform. Our priority is going to be online and WhatsApp. Uh, and we're trying to understand how we could do social distance services and what's allowed under level three. So we're still trying to understand if people are feeling comfortable, how we would put safety protocols in place. Um, so we're still yeah, trying to figure out how we're going to do in-person work in communities. But for now, we're going to put priority on online and WhatsApp-based services. Yeah, well, one of the things we do in communities that's really cool is uh, we have a mental health program for teenagers. So mental health is a big challenge. A lot of us may be more aware after COVID than before that uh, our mental health is really important to our overall health. So we have an after-school program that works with young teenagers, helping them develop skills to cope with stress, uh, things around breathing techniques, around understanding their emotions. So this is a program that we've been delivering after school for the last year. Um, but we also deliver uh, yoga, which is a, we deliver a, a physical yoga practice, which has been shown to improve mental well-being. And we also do something called meditation or mindfulness in a group setting. And that's, again, a proven approach to improving skills around coping with stress and your emotions. Um, you can reach out to us through our website, which is www.healthwarriors.org. Um, that can give you access to our online resources. That can give you access if you'd like to join one of our wellness groups on WhatsApp. And then the training, yeah, the training is a little trickier because these are really intense, usually in-person trainings uh, that last somewhere between 200 to 250 hours. So we're trying to figure out how we might put something like that online. But for now, we have around 25 trained facilitators, um, and we're going to see how we can really activate them to, to spread the work we're doing in communities. The first thing is we have limitations on what we can do. We make all of our online resources open access and free. So anyone can come to our website and download anything that we put out there. Uh, but obviously, there are very specific needs young people may have uh, and understanding what's in the community. So if there are social workers, psychologists, other services, that's really important for schools to understand. Um, under the integrated school health policy, there should be a counselor or social worker connected to schools, but again, we know that uh, sometimes resources don't exist. So I guess the first thing is for schools just to be aware that this is a time of stress for young people and coming back to school add stress. Um, so being aware that there may be mental health issues is a really important first step. A campaign calling on the national government to allow neighborhood watchers to resume their work has finally come to fruition. Community Safety MEC Albert Fritz said the presence of neighborhood watchers would help prevent crime. Fritz said that during the lockdown there was an increase in vandalism at schools and shop robberies in rural and urban communities. Many neighborhood watchers and community police forums had raised their hands and offered support during this difficult period.
In a sports update, football clubs across South Africa are tender hooks waiting to hear if and when they will be allowed to complete the season behind closed door. Safa and the PSL joined Le Hayes and community and had come up with a plan but a wait to hear from Sports Minister Natim Tetwa who recently said clubs could return to contact training as the government is coronavirus lockdown to level 3. But with the restart dates and the centralised safe zone yet to be confirmed after a series of meetings this week, a lack of communication is a cause for concern for the clubs. On to international news. The World Health Organization has held its daily briefing on the spread of coronavirus, answering some of its most pressing questions ranging from the use of hydroxychloroquine and its effectiveness, as well as the vaccine Russia has alleged would cure the virus. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to take the floor and for giving me the opportunity to pose questions. Now, my question is to do with hydroxychloroquine. Certain, certain countries have stopped the use of this medicine and we have seen a rise in cases, in particular in intensive care units and also in terms of the number of deaths. There are certain countries that continue to use this medicine and these countries have uh, these countries have seen a rise or they've seen improvements so what can you say with regard to this contradiction thank you maybe i i can start and uh, dr sumia can supplement here i i think uh, uh well, I, 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 re I respect the the, um, <coughs> the, uh, the spirit of your question. I think we need to be very careful in making associations uh, like you've just made, because of, to assume that uh, the use or not of a drug in general in a country is resulting in increases or decreases of cases is not something uh, that, uh, that one can do, quite frankly. Uh, what we have done as WHO and many other researchers around the world <coughs> and national authorities have done is put in place randomized controlled trials in order to test which drugs are effective and which drugs actually help patients and save lives. Um, we thank all our partners around the world who are participating in the solidarity trials, uh, but there are other recovery trials and other discovery trials happening <coughs> right around the world to look at what are the most effective uh, drugs uh, in, in, in use uh, right now against COVID-19. With regard to the specific issue of hydroxychloroquine in this trial, uh, Sumia may wish to, to add more detail regarding that. I think just to add uh, to what uh, Mike said, as of now, there's no evidence that any drug actually reduces the mortality in um, patients who have COVID-19. And in fact, it's an urgent priority for all of us to do the needed studies, to do the randomized clinical trials in order to get that evidence as quickly as possible. So WHO is very much in favor of and encourages the continuation of randomized trials that are looking at, at different drugs to reduce mortality, uh, but also to reduce the um, severity of the illness. And these are the big public health questions that uh, we are trying to answer. And, I, and, and again, to repeat what we've been saying all along, observational studies have limitations. Um, you can do analyses, uh, but there are so many um, potential biases in the way that you know, patients are managed in a regular clinical setting that the only way to get definitive answers is to do well-conducted randomized trials. And it's particularly important in emergency uh, settings to do these because that's the only way to find out what really are the, those um, drugs or those strategies that will reduce death, that will reduce uh, illness, that will reduce infection rates in communities. And we should be guided by the science and by the evidence. Good afternoon, thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is actually about um, the new drug, which Russia claims they have, um, which Russia actually approves to, to, to treat COVID-19 and they claimed it was effective against it, but um, I, I want to know what um, the current position of WHO is. And also, um, they said that the number of patients tested for it, it was 330 people. 
I wanted to know also if this was a big enough sample to actually um, test a drug's effectiveness. Thank you. So we have received uh, information that uh, abifavir, abifavir, which is similar to favipavir, has been uh, tested and that the drug that's actually been created by the Russian Direct Investment Fund in conjunction with the Chemical Diversity Research Institute will be um, provided in Russian hospitals uh, very soon. Um, we, it was, it's been developed and tested in clinical trials in Russia and we would very much like to see um, and would be keen to see the results of those uh, trials and are eager to know if there are drugs that are effective and safe for the use of COVID-19 patients. That's all from the news front, but when we come back, we look at what's making news on social media. Welcome back. You're still watching the Our City COVID-19 show. I'm Stephanie Pitt. In the following video, infectious diseases expert Professor Salim Abdul Karim weighs in on the effectiveness of the national lockdown announced by President Cyril Ramaphosa in a bid to curb the spread of the virus. So has the lockdown and has the state of disaster had an effect on reducing the number of cases of COVID-19? Well, the answer to that comes from the epidemic trajectory that we have. So we know that roughly about 12 to 14 days after the declaration of the state of disaster, we see a dramatic drop in the number of new cases. And that's really an impact of the state of the disaster. So clearly all of those active actions that were taken, those interventions to stop international traffic, close the schools and so on, they had a marked impact. However, that impact would have started wearing off. And so the lockdown occurred at a time that it reinforced the benefits that we had with the state of disaster. And so the two are combined. And how do we know that? Because when we start looking at the number of infections in the second week after the lockdown, we get some impression of how the number of infections is steadily going down. And that can only be because temporarily, then that's associated with the lockdown. So the lockdowns had a benefit. However, we know that that benefit is only temporary. Once you ease the lockdown, we expect that the viral transmission will start again. So what have we achieved? Well, we've essentially achieved time. We've bought some time to prepare We've bought some time to improve our interventions and we've bought some time to flatten the curve. In flattening the curve, we hope we won't have that same demand on our healthcare system that you see in an exponential growth epidemic. Now let's take a look at the popular hashtags on Twitter today. Hashtag UFs must fall. Some students are unimpressed with the university's learning app and the allowance for laptops and data. Meanwhile, the controversial statue of Martinez Tinas Stein will finally fall and be relocated to the Bloemfontein Museum. Hashtag brown vinegar and salt. A TikTok video has gone crazy on social platforms. It claims that by putting brown vinegar and salt under the bed, one can see witches. But a scientist has warned that the mixture makes hydrochloric acid, which can be very dangerous. We'd like to know your views on burning issues during this pandemic. So we'll be burning, posting burning questions on our daily, Facebook page daily, Our City CT. You can also follow us on Twitter at Our City CT. That's it from me, Stephanie Pitt. Please stay with us. After the break, Michaela Miller will be giving you information on resources and places of safety you can access during this period. Stay with us.
Welcome back. You're still tuned into Our City, the COVID show on Cape Town TV, Channel 263. Here's a recap of today's headlines. The Western Cape government tightens its testing regulations due to the backlog of 27,000 tests. As schools reopen for grade 7s and 12s in the province, we asked matriculants how they felt about going back to school. And Chris Barkley, co-founder and CEO of Health Warriors, tells us what they're doing to help South Africans deal with the anxiety brought about by the coronavirus. The World Health Organization answers pressing questions on the vaccine that Russia has alleged would cure the virus. If you are in need of any assistance, here are some organizations helping communities stay safe during this period. That's it from the Our City COVID-19 news show, but we'll continue giving you the latest news on what's happening in Cape Town on our Facebook page at Our City CT and on Twitter at Our City CT. You can also get in touch with us via email on ourcity at capetowntv.org or call us on 021-448-0448. From me, Michaela Miller and the Our City News crew, enjoy the rest of your Thursday.